All right, we are now recording the first of many Bible studies on, uh, this one is going to be on the book of Ruth. Has anyone read through, dealt with, had anything to do with the book of Ruth ever? It's open. Hold on just a minute. Um, there's, by the way, there is a chat room section. Um, it's in your screen. It has that. There's also these little fun reactions where you can give a thumbs up or a hand clap. So if I say something absolutely wonderful, give me an applause, right? So there's that. Um, let me get this going. In the beginning. Okay. Okay. Well, if everybody can hear me, we're all good. Um, this is the first of the book of Ruth. So for me, the book of Ruth came about when I was in seminary. Um, I had to read this book in Hebrew and translate it to English, which was very long and tedious. It took an entire semester to do. Um, but it created a big love for this book that I adore. It's fantastic. So um, can everybody see my little slideshow? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yep. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so this is kind of an introduction. Uh, I will say that this book is, I say it's PG-13. It has a little bit of sexual innu innuendo in it. So uh, just warning if there's younger ones around. But in order to study this book, there's a couple of little key terms that you have to know. Uh, the first one is about a leveret marriage. Um, when it comes to leveret marriage, people get a little woozy about it because it's kind of funny in the Bible. And basically it's if a guy is married and in the Old Testament, if he died and did not have a kid, his brother was supposed to take the wife and have a kid in his name. That person became known as the kinsman redeemer. Um, and all that, pardon? Never mind. Never okay. Mind. All that stuff is found in, it's in Deuteronomy. And here's what that ultimately is about. And it's about it's kind of like life insurance. Back then, women were not able to really buy or sell, so they couldn't do anything without a male person. They either bought in their dad's name, their husband's name, or their son's name. If there wasn't a male around, they just didn't do anything. So the idea here was to make sure that this woman was not left in a desolate position. So this person was to redeem her to make sure that she was able to go buy, sell, et cetera, et cetera. That makes sense? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Here is where it's, and this is not going to get into it till later in the story, but here's where it gets PG-13 a little. The word for feet in Hebrew can be, in some cases, used as a euphemism for male genitals. And again, there's a reason for it that will come in later in the story, but I'm just trying to put up some key terms that you'll kind of know about that will make sense later in the story. Uh, it'll also make sense on the sandals. For example, that same text in, that I was talking about with leveret marriage, if the guy didn't want to redeem her, if he didn't want to marry her, the text in Deuteronomy says, however, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town and say, my husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of the town will summon him, talk to him, and if he persists, saying, I do not want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up 
go up to him in the presence of elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face and say, this is what is done to the man who has not built up his brother's family line. Again, that's going to be important later in the story. You'll understand why, what it means later on whenever it brings up about sandals. So just kind of put that in the corner of your mind. Also, this story has a little bit of hidden gems in it. Um, for example, the beginning of Ruth, and by the way, the only book that you're going to need in this is your Bible. If you don't have one, grab one, use your phone, use your whatever you want to, um, and we'll start here in the actual text. But, for example, the first line in Ruth, it says, in the year the judges judged, there was a famine in the land of Bethlehem. Well, famine, and the Hebrew word for house is Beth. Lehem in Hebrew means bread. So the beginning of the book says there is a famine in the house of bread. So it's already starting with a little bit of, I said, irony at the beginning. Next, sometimes the Hebrew names were descriptive instead of actual. And this is the case with Naomi's children, or at least I think it is. Otherwise, Naomi and her husband were kind of rude people. But I use the example in Hosea, the kids named it Lu Rohama, which means not loved, and Lu Amai, which means not mine. Can you imagine having a kid and naming them, I don't love you and you're not mine? That was the description that was trying to be told then. Well, in here, Ruth's kid's name, or uh, not Ruth's kids, uh, that's a typo in my slideshow. Naomi's kids' names were Mahan, which meant sickness, and Chalhan, which meant wasting away. And then later in the story, right at the beginning, the first chapter, it says, Naomi said to call her Mara, which means bitter. Any questions for what we have so far before we get going? Looks good. All right. In the days when the judges ruled, or in the days when the judges judged, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the city of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his sons were Malhon and Kilion. They were Euphrodites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab to live there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women. By the way, that was a bad thing to do. He didn't ever want to marry a Moabite woman. I don't remember why, but it was one of those things you stayed within your tribe, so they wanted them to stay. But instead, they married two Moabite women. Uh, I lost my place. Oh, there we go. Uh, the name of the women were Orpah, and the other's name was Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malhon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and a husband. So if you remember what I talked about before, there was no male heir here. There was no male anything. Instead, now these three women are left without anybody. So they're kind of in a bad spot. So that's where the story picks up. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come up, come to aid his people by finding food for them, she and her daughters-in-law pre prepared to turn home. When her daughters-in-law left, she left the place and she had been living and set out in the road and would take them back to the land of Judah. Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back, each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you've shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. And may the Lord grant each of you to find rest in a home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept out loud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. So, 
she's basically telling these Moabite women who are not going to be treated very nicely in her hometown because Moabite people are not treated very well, that you need to go back home. This is not going to end well for you. And these women are very gracious and nice to her at first. They kind of are like, okay, make sure, you know, we're, they, they wept with her because they're kind of still in mourning. But Naomi said, return home. Why would you come home with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home because I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I did, if I even thought there was still hope for me, if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, why would you wait until they grew up? So she's basically kind of reasoning with them saying, you can't, even if I got married today, got pregnant today, nine months later, I'm having a baby. This is not a good situation. Go home. I keep losing my place. So, uh, and she, why would you remain unmarried for them? She said, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord has turned his hand to me. And they wept out loud Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and said, bye. So some people give Orpah a little bit of a bad rap here because she kind of bails. But in reality, did any of you blame her given the situation for her leaving? No. I do want feedback. So people talk back. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Hey, does it? Does anybody see any hope in this situation for these three women? No. Well, particularly given the rules of the laws back then, it's an absolute no. Yeah. So they're kind of in a real bad spot. Did we lose some people? Okay. All right. Um, so Orpah left, and some people do. They kind of give her a And here's why, because uh, and because Naomi says, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people, and her dad is <laughs> back with her. And then this story, this one of those verses that people like to quote with Ruth, because um, it's really a, a good verse, but it's one of the things that if you not putting it in the right context, I guess. Um, but Ruth said, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Now, has anybody heard that verse before? Seen it on the little yes, painting you, placards, yeah. your people will be my right. people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen it on a wedding invitation. What's that? I've seen it on the front of a wedding invitation. Yeah. But in this case, it's really Ruth being a bit, I want to say naive, but she kind of is like, okay, well, I'm going to hang in this with you, but she's also not leaving her alone. So it's a nice little verse, but, and it says, where you die, I will die and there will be, and there will be buried. May the Lord deal with me and it will be ever so severely, even if death separates you me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. And the two women went on to Bethlehem and they arrived there. The whole town was stirred because they said, can this be Naomi? <clears throat> said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. And I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune on me. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem, and the barley harvest was beginning. And that is where chapter one ends. So one, there was this kind of a rule that you didn't go intermingle with Moabite people. And then here, Naomi has her two sons. They marry Moabite women. They both die. And as she comes back home, and she's basically coming back home in the worst possible situation, and she feels God is punishing her. She feels very bitter. She feels God has left her alone. Has anybody ever felt that way? It really stinks when the whole world seems like it's crashing in on you. Now, again, this is a very introduction, a very much introduction to this story it gets much, much better. And we're going to kind of go on to the next part. But 
it's not starting off very good. Starting off leaving two women in a very bad spot where they're going to basically beg for food because even if they were wealthy, they can't buy without a male person and they can't even own wealth without a male relative. So what do, what would, what should they do? Well, chapter two picks up, says Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go over to the fields and pick leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. So what she was going to do, she was going to go in the field and while they were harvesting grain, whatever <laughs> little crumbs fell off the ground, she was going to scoop up and take for herself. She was going to be just kind of a scrap beggar. A couple of things about that. This is a very dangerous thing for a female to do. Imagine a large field, however many acres you want. Workers that are servant workers, and now you have a female scraping up grains off the ground with men who are sweaty working and there's no real laws against it. Imagine what is hap what can happen here to this female. And that's kind of what she's walking into. And Naomi said, go ahead, my daughter. She went out into the field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was that of the clan of Elimelech. But when Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters, he said, the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseers, what does this young, who does this young woman belong to? So Boaz saw her doing it. And this is kind of the setup for the story because again, it's a very dangerous setup because you're going in a field with a bunch of workers you don't know, but it's pretty wide open. So not many people can hear screams, hollers, anything else like that. And he's going in there and he says, who is this? Who is she? The overseers replied that she's the Moabite that came back with Naomi. And she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves and harvesters. So she came into the field and she remained here in the morning until for a short time in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Do not glean in other fields. Do not go away, but stay, away, stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along. So he basically kind of tells her, don't go anywhere else. Stay here because here you'll be safe. So he's already starting to kind of take care of it. He's like, make sure you don't glean anywhere else. He's not sa he's saying, pick off my field only. Don't go anywhere else because it's dangerous everywhere else, but stay and work with my folks. And then as she does this, he told everybody there, if you wouldn't we, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Uh, hold on a minute. Let's bow to face ground. Why have I found favor in your eyes? I'm trying to find what I'm looking for. Uh, basically, she's very happy that ha that happened, but he told his workers to make sure that they a did not rape her, did not hurt her, did not. <coughs> but then he also told them to, as they were harvesting, to grab a handful of grain and throw it on the ground for her. Um, and then on top of that, at mealtime, he gave her some bread, bread and wine and vinegar. And, but he, in verse 15, it said, uh, let her gather among the sheaves, don't remind her, don't pull out some, and even pull out some stuff her from bundles and leave them for her to pick up. So she got to pick up a whole lot more than what normal person would do. Again, I recognize that part of this story seems a little bit boring, but what it's setting up 
is it's setting up for um, you're going to see a relationship between Boaz and Ruth. And I'm kind of giving a little bit of the end of the story a little bit. But Boaz, from the moment he saw her, he immediately started taking care of her. He immediately started making sure that she was okay, making sure that she was in good shape, telling all the harvesters not to hurt her, to leave her alone, and to even grab extra, throwing it on the ground so she could have enough. Y'all see a little bit of where this story is going? Yes. Any questions so far? Because we've got about eight minutes left, so I don't really want to get too far into the story because we got a few more chapters left. But any room for discussion? Any questions about the keywords? Because, again, I promise you it's going to get really, really good. But you have two late. You have at first three ladies. One, they all their husbands die. They're left desolate. And then you have a guy that's starting to take care of them and setting up for two of them. Any questions, concerns, discussions? That's one question I had is at the end of chapter two, it talks about Ruth still living with her mother-in-law, which sure, that makes sense. But okay, if they don't have men, they can't own property. <laughs> where are they living? I don't, it doesn't really kind of address that. I don't know if there's any hypothesis on that or not. But They're staying in like a shack in, in the father-in-law's. In, in this, They're staying with Boaz. It, it, it doesn't specifically say it, but um, let me find it where it was saying. When it said Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, that's kind of what it's saying. Like they're going to go to her, go to him. So they, they go. That's that's where it's talking about. They're going to him where they're staying with him somewhere. How, where, I don't know. And then that's where they come up with the idea to go gleam for food. So Naomi's husband was actually related to blood relative to Boaz, right? What's that? Naomi's husband, deceased husband, her dead husband, was a blood relative of Boaz? Yes. Boaz is a relative of Elimelech. So he kind of had, didn't he have some obligation to take care of Naomi? That's where the whole kinsman, redeemer, and clan thing came about. The part that was interesting, so yes, he had to take care of Naomi, but Ruth was a Moabite. Moabites were the enemy, and then Ruth kind of went to Moab, so she kind of left home to go to the enemy's territory. But she came back, so she came back in this shamed mode because her husband's died. She felt God was punishing her. And then, yes, Boaz did have some kind of regard. They, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody here has family that's drove you crazy and you've kind of distanced yourself from them, but you still love them no matter what. And if they came just to completely desolate in the worst possible condition and said, I need a place to stay for the night, is anybody going to not open the door for him? No. That's kind of what this picture is trying to say. It's trying to say they did everything wrong at first, at least wrong in that scenario. They gave it where she went to enemy country, her sons married enemy women. So <clears throat> they died and Again, the, the story is just telling him that the son's name were sick and wasteful and there was famine in the land. So the reason they left was because there was famine in the land, but they came back and now Boaz is taking care of them. But not only does he take care of them, he doesn't leave them to where they're just scrapping by. He makes sure he feeds them. He makes sure he gives them enough food. And this is where the story is going to get really, really good. And we're going to pick up on it next week. One little interesting tidbit. Oprah Winfrey is named after Orpa in this story, but they transposed the two letters. I didn't know that, but that is an interesting tidbit. Hmm. 
So anyways, if you will come back next week, I promise you the story gets really, really good. Because, but I can tell you it's when you read it slowly it, and you start seeing some of the pictures that come out, it's just a really exciting thing. So any other questions? Did anybody enjoy this? Any issues, concerns? I don't know if the sound went well. No, it was good, but we need to help Cheryl get on. She went away. Yeah, I lost two people, but we are recording it. So I'm going to, after it's recorded, it's going to be saved, and I'm going to work with Peter, hopefully, and get it posted. So oh, that'd be um, great. Anyway, we'll talk, Michael. Um, on, on the Cheryl perspective, she has trouble with computer audio, Michael, and I don't know if you've got a dial-in number or not set up I for sent, this. I sent it to her on the chat room. It they send when they do the invitation, they send me a New York number, a Germantown number, Chicago, San Jose, Tacoma, and Houston. So it's all a long distance number, but you can dial in and hear the sound because that's why we were going with Zoom. Um, right. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. I think most people these days, especially with cell phones, long distance is kind of a don't care. So that's fine. Um, I think I forget what um, I forget what Rosemary usually includes as far as the dial in numbers. Um, so, well, I, I can also say I want to thank the session. They made this possible because they were able to get a Zoom account for the church that we're using. And it is a, it's a, it's a professional subscription that allows me to record because my personal one does not. Uh, it also gives un, it, like up to a hundred people. So we're very thankful for the session of hope for giving us this way of doing it while we're meeting virtually. And I am so glad all of you came. So uh, can I close with prayer? Is there any prayer request? <laughs> Yes, Tom Lovell, who is the pastor at uh, Faith, his son and daughter-in-law were in a very bad accident. Yeah, I'm, probably still in the hospital. But, they are. Uh, I, to, I, uh, I go to Faith. To them. Yeah, I go to Faith, and <clears throat> I'm doing what Rosemary did last week. I am preaching at. I'm going to be recording at Faith tomorrow. Uh, the same sermon that's going to be preached for you guys. So <laughs> uh, she, she posted on her Facebook. She said she gets the excitement of being in two places at once. So now I get to do the same. <laughs> but yeah, I, it's a very, they, they sent us a, um, an update on that just so y'all can be informed if you would like. Um, yeah. The the update. Hold on just a second, and I can. Pull I saw it up. Becky Mom's on Facebook. She updated it. Um, from Krista Lovell, it said one week ago the universe changed for the Lovell and Whitley family when a speeding car blew through a stop sign and hit the side of a car that was only two miles from home. Today, uh -huh. Monday, Ben Lovell heads into his second surgery to repair bones that were broken while still breathing on a ventilator and recovering from a brain bleed. Today, Anna continues to heal slowly from her multiple internal and spinal injuries. Countless medical people have told us how lucky they are to be alive. We know otherwise. Uh, thank you, friends, for prayers that are upholding our two families. We told the road ahead it, for these two is long, and we as parents are committed to be with them, knowing that God will be our guide, our comfort, and our peace. P keep praying, friends. Your support is getting us through each day. Um, and that was from Krista Lovell, Tom's wife. So, um, and then, of course, we want to keep Pastor Christy in prayers as well. Yes. So, are there any others? Keep Joanna there. <laughs> Thank you. And my husband, they said the hospital's full again. He's never going to get that bad. Yeah. 
Yeah, the hospital's full again. Unfortunately, COVID numbers are continuing to spike. No. And I can tell you, I hate these things with an absolute passion, but it is what it is, right? <laughs> That's right. So you're going to get in trouble for saying that our president. I know. That's why after I said it, I was like, uh oh. <laughs> I think you're voicing the opinion of most of us, but you know, it's a necessary evil. Yeah. And then in, in honor for uh, Pastor Christie, even though she's not here, I'll share a Diet Coke. <laughs> so, well, let's pray together. Thank you so much. Thank What's that? You. What was that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. Well, let's pray together. Holy God, we are thankful that we can come together in a virtual setting like this. Uh, we're thankful that we can study uh, the Bible. We're thankful that you give us wonderful and rich stories. And it's about to get really, really good. And I know the end of the story, and I know some real fun parts to this story. But I'm thankful that you give us these holy scriptures that give us truth for our life. But we ask that you be with our prayer requests. We have so many concerns. Our country is continuing to be divided. So we ask that you continue to be with the leaders. Give them wisdom. Let them stop fighting amongst each other and work for the people. But we ask you to be with our local prayer concerns from Pastor Christie, who's out on sick leave. Everyone in this church wants her back, wants her healthy. She does so much, and she's such a wonderful minister that um, everyone wants her to be healthy when she returns. We also ask that you be with Tom Lovell and Krista Lovell and Ben and his wife as they are going through this vicious, awful ordeal from the car accident. Continue to be with both families as they care for their children. Be with both Ben and Anna as they are healing and taking care of things. Uh, then we ask you to be with Joanna and be with uh, the Dennis family as they're working through getting hospital beds. God, we ask you to be with all kinds of people. That This is a crazy world we're living in. But we know in the fullness of time, you will take care of all things. So lead us, guide us, direct us, and we're thankful for you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Grace you. says, hey, to everybody, she would have been here, just had to work a little later than expected, unfortunately. So, Well, as mentioned, I'm going to end the recording and I'm going to end the meeting. Tomorrow when I get back to work, I'll figure out about how to get it in a format to where we can post it on Facebook and I can get it to Cindy and we'll go from there. Hopefully I'll see you all next week. I promise you story gets really, really good. So <laughs> have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.